Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergera.com. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Um, I am excited because this message has been the series has been amazing so far. The worship this morning was incredible. I was one of those people who, who came in with back pain, prayed, and I'm feeling real good. You know? Yes. We can, we can, we can give a praise for God. Let's do it, y'all. Come on. Come on. All right. So as we get into this series, we all recognize, all of us in leadership recognize that this is a challenging series. And it's meant to be a challenging series. So when you have questions, because I have no doubt that you will have questions, don't be afraid to bring those questions to leadership. We're here to answer those questions. We're here to, to talk it through, to give context where context is needed. And we just, we're all in this together. Um, as, we, as we're going through this series, we're all being challenged. And that's the beautiful thing about conviction. There's no condemnation here, right? Condemnation comes from the enemy, and conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. And when conviction comes and we recognize conviction, it gives us the chance to transform. It gives us the chance to let Jesus take over and to be critically altered to our core into who he's called us to be. Does that make sense? Does that sound good? All right. So just wanted to open that up and say we're here to answer your questions. And as you feel conviction and as you feel yourself wrestling, just know that you're not the only one. We're wrestling with this too. We're living in a world that doesn't preach Jesus and we're trying to make it make sense for us and for everyone else. So we love you guys and we're here for you. All right. So as we get into this um, series this morning, we are going to do the Game Changer Proclamation. So this is it. So if you want to repeat with me on three, one, two, three. He is who he says he is. I am who he says I am. He has what he says he has. I have what he says he, I have. He can do what he says he can do. I can do what he says I can do. Amen. So, so good. So let's get into this this morning. I want to stress the importance to you of the Bible. We all know that this book has been around for thousands of years, and we know the power. It's the most powerful book that has ever been created. The words are God-breathed, timeless, ageless. They're for you. They're for me. They're for the people that have gone before us and the people that will come after us. They were taken into battle with people who marched into battle. They were on the lips of those who were rounded up and put on a train and taken to Auschwitz. And they were the prayers that guided slaves out of slavery years and years and years ago. This is a powerful, powerful Bible. It is alive and it has the power to cut and modify and create us into the people that God has called us to be. It is for times of peace. It is for times of war, for seasons of joy, seasons of grief. It is for the confusion that we feel when we look out at the world, and it is for the confidence that we know that we have in who Christ is. This book, thousands of years old, bound in leather, orally passed down, and even illuminated on our phones at night before we go to bed, this book is for you, and it's for me, and, it's, and we need to know right now everything that this book says more now than ever before. If you don't have a Bible, we, I will buy you a Bible, okay? Let me know. We have some out there. They're paper bound. You can take those with you. If you want a nice one, I will buy you a nice one, okay? You just hit me up. You just let me know. I'll get you a Bible. Sound good? All right. That being said, we are going to a point in the Bible that's in the Old Testament hundreds and hundreds of years ago that looks like what we're seeing right now. It was a time of great, great confusion. And when I look out at the world right now, that's what I see. I see a lot of confusion. Um, since the beginning of time, we've talked many times about covenant and what covenant means. And God has just continually made covenant with, with humans. And 
a covenant simply means it's an agreement between, it's not so simple, but it means that it is an agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. We've seen it with Abraham, Moses, David. There is often a sacrifice of blood that goes into sealing a covenant. And we're going to a time now with Israel where they have again broken covenant with God. And the beautiful thing about the God that we serve is that he never breaks his covenant with us. He always upholds his side of the covenant. And time and time again, though we disappoint and we break and we broke that covenant, he kept coming back to us. He kept renewing those covenants until Jesus, the very, very last sacrifice that needed to be made, was made, and that was the covenant for all time, and that's where we get the New Testament. So we're going back to the Old Testament, and again, we're just seeing that it's us. It's the human factor that continues to mess up this covenant and our relationship with God. And we find Israel at a time of disobedience and rebellion. Um, we're going to the book of Ezekiel, if you want to pull that up. Um, at this point in time, Jerusalem is under siege. They are being attacked by the Babylonians, and a large portion of their people have been captured and forced into exile out into the desert. And they are living out in the desert, and Jerusalem, the holy city where God's temple actually physically resides, is under siege still. They are still being attacked by the Babylonians. Um, Ezekiel is a young guy. He's li currently living as a refugee in this camp. He do they don't have their home. They don't have their city. They don't have their temple. They are out in the wild. And for Ezekiel, this is a super challenging time for him because it's his birthday. He's turning 30. And this would have been the time when he was actually inducted into the priesthood in Israel. He would have been serving as an intermediary between God and his chosen people. And as he's sitting there and he's feeling really bad for himself, obviously like his, he's feeling like he's lost out on the calling of his life. Um, that he's not going to be able to serve in the capacity that he knew he was called to serve, he receives a vision from God. And the book of Ezekiel, if you haven't read it, it's kind of tough. comes after Lamentations, which that's kind of tough. Um, and it's just a really, really challenging time for the Israelite people and for people in general. The book of Ezekiel in particular is heavily prophetic. It's very symbolic, but it's both symbolic and historically factual. So we're going to be talking about the historical nature of Ezekiel, but we're also going to be talking about the, the visions and the prophecies that he was having and what they still mean today. So he was supposed to be inducted into the priesthood at this time. He's supposed to be going and serving in the temple, and he has this vision from God. And God shows up and says to him in Ezekiel 2, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or they fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And he even goes on to tell Ezekiel that, hey, I have this message for you. Your heart is going to be burdened. You're going to, you're going to express these visions. You're going to tell the people these prophecies and what they mean, and it's going to be tough for you. And also, they might not listen to you. And he describes being among these people as being among briars, thorns, and scorpions. So, if you ever want to be in ministry, sometimes it'd just be like that. You know what I mean? 100%. Um, they, God knows, hands down, that the Israelites are very, very challenging people. So he receives this vision, and he sees the glory of God, which actually sits, on, sits in the temple that is God's throne here on earth in the Old Testament. His glory sits in this temple 
in Jerusalem in the holy city. And he sees the glory of God in this vision rise up off from the temple and come out into the desert and rest with his people who are in exile. And he sees a further vision of why God's holy presence has lifted off from the temple. And it's because they have actually erected pagans in pagan statues inside of the temple, and they are serving and worshiping and praying to other gods. They're praying to idols. So God has removed himself. He has removed his holy presence off from the temple and brought it out into exile to be with his people. And he explains to Ezekiel that he will be his priest and he will speak through him to the nation of, Is- of Israel. And like I said, this isn't fun. It's because of how rebellious the Israelites are, but also the message that he has is not a happy one. It's one about judgment. He is going to be telling the Israelites that they are going to be given over to their wickedness. It's not something that God is doing to them. It's something that they have brought upon themselves, and he is going to let it happen because his judgment has fallen on them, and they need to understand, and they need to see his love, his devotion, his power, and his de- his holiness. They need to understand his holiness and that this is going to be a really hard season for them. And they think right now being in exile, this is like the worst it's going to be. They think that this is bad and it is not even scratching the surface of how bad it's going to be. If you read the book, you will understand. It's going to get real, real tough. Um, The people of Israel, even after everything that God has done, leading them out of Egypt, the miracles that they've witnessed, the established of the establishment of the holy city in their promised land, all of these things, they have still chosen to rebel. They've been seduced by the world. They have chosen to serve other gods with their, with their worship, with their bodies, with their prayer. And now comes a time of reckoning. And that time is coming to fruition through the forceful nature of the Babylonians. And if you don't know who the Babylonians are, they are from Babylon. They have been around for a long time. They are still around today. They are currently, that is modern day Iraq. That is where the Babylonian kingdom was. And they first show up. Does anybody know where Babylon first shows up in the Bible? How far back it goes? Well, you know, of course you do. It goes all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 11. So they show up at the very, very beginning. So we see the struggle of Israelites with this this specific group of people all the way back to Genesis. They were actually the ones who erected the Tower of Babel because they wanted to be like God. They wanted to communicate with God. They wanted this tower to go all the way up to heaven. And God destroyed the tower and actually divided the people by giving them different languages so they could no longer understand each other. So these are the very, very same people. They are a nation that has never decreased in power, that it has only grown and grown and grown. And their name in the Greek, Babylonians, the Babylon, it means gate of the gods. And that is kind of what they have been to the Israelite people. They have been a gate into idolatry and worshiping of many, many idols that are not the one true God. And Ezekiel is told by God that he has to tell the refugees that Jerusalem, their holy city, that again at this point is still intact, is going to fall. Not only is it going to fall, but the temple of the Lord is going to be destroyed. God is going to let it be destroyed. They're going to be handed over to their wickedness. And as he is telling the people this, he's not just telling the people this. He's actually doing these, like, physical actings. He's showing them, hey, this is what it's going to look like. This is what exile is going to look like. And he's acting it out, and he's doing these things that are really hard for him. They're, they're not fun. He is, he's showing suffering that is to come, and he's suffering in showing it. And no one listens to him. And what's more is that God told him there was a very good chance that no one would. And he is so like our God. Our God is that good. Even when he knows that we're not going to listen, he still sends a prophet. He still sends someone to tell you his heart for you specifically. He still still sends a light in the dark. That is how good our God is. So like I said, Ezekiel has to do these crazy things. He's not only telling him the visions and the prophecies that they're actually seeing come about currently, um, but he's acting them out. At one point, he has to 
act out being a scapegoat, which a scapegoat was actually this goat that they, they used in Jewish ceremony where they would get a goat and they would, they would spiritually and I guess they would go through the motions of the religious act of applying the sins of the nation of Israel to this goat and they would send it out into the wilderness. So then everyone would be sin free. That was what the scapegoat. They took the place of our actual suffering for the things that we had done. If you think about it, Jesus is very much the scapegoat who takes on the sins of the world so that we don't have to live with the consequences of those sins. So he, he has to act out the part of a scapegoat. So he lies on his side for one year and he has to eat food that's cooked over poop, over human feces. Yeah, Salem, I'm feeling you, dude. Um, he has, because he's saying that this is what this is going to look like for Israel. Like, things are going to be so bad, y'all aren't going to be able to find, like, a stick to burn in the wilderness. That's how bad this exile is going to get. At another time, he has to cut all of his hair off with um, shears and then cut that hair with a sword. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, grieving was something that they did in Israel when someone died or they were grieving. They would cut all their hair off. So he, he's showing like a great mourning is coming. Like we are going to be mourning our loss of our nation, of our holy city. And then at another point, he has to act out the actual second exile that is to come. He has to gather all of his things, throw them in a sack without saying anything. And at a certain time of the evening, he has to dig a hole through the mud wall and go out into the desert. He's showing them what this is going to look like. And he suffers so much in the doing of, of showing them what it's going to be like. At one point, God tells him, um, hey, this is going to be hard. I am going to remove the delight of Israel's eyes. And by doing that, I'm going to remove the delight of your eye. And I don't know if Ezekiel exactly knows what that means, but that night, his wife dies. And God tells him that when you, you go through this great morning, you're not going to do the things that you usually do. You're not going to take the time to cr cry and groan and mourn. You're not going to cover your face or your beard, and you're not going to eat the, the ceremonial foods of mourning because... When Israel's morning comes, they're not going to have the time or the strength or the energy to do this. So he's showing them just how desperate they're going to be when this time comes. And people are seeing this, and they're pretty unsettled. I mean, you're unsettled. I'm unsettled. Like, the people of Israel are like, what is going on? And it says in Ezekiel 24, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection, the sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary foods of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will taste, but will waste away because your sins and groan among yourselves. Ezekiel will be assigned to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. And yes, I get that this is heavy. This is, this is a heavy way to, to begin a service with this kind of scripture and this kind of story. But Israel's rebellion from God, our rebellion from God is heavy. And God will let this happen. He lets this happen so that they can see his holiness and also understand their neediness of him. The temple has just become this, the temple in and of itself has just become this, like, this is who we are. This is centered to our identity. And he's saying, I'm going to wipe this away because I'm centered to your ident identity. Not this temple where my, whole, where my spirit resides, but I, me. And even as he is telling Israel that all of this is going to happen to them, he is he is also telling Ezekiel that it's going to happen beyond Israel. It's going to happen to the nations that are surrounding them. So Egypt and Tyre and all of these other nations that have really led to the godlessness that Israel is living in, the rebellion that they are, they are living in, they are also going to be given over to their wickedness. All of their rebellion and injustice will end in ruin. And just as he is sharing this vision, just as his wife has died, and they are understanding that their temple is going to be ruined, 
a single survivor comes into the camp and he is the only person who has survived the fall of Jerusalem. So just as Ezekiel said, Jerusalem has fallen, the holy city that was under siege has physically fallen, and the temple has been absolutely demolished. The amount of grieving that takes place, the delight of their eye, the center of their culture, the identity that they, they have fit into their centers as God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Jews, even in their rebellion, they are mourning so much because of this loss. It was what was given to them in the promised land. It was, it was what they understood that they were going to, to have to hold to. And God's saying, nope, you don't have it anymore. I'm going to decimate that because I'm the only thing that you should be holding to. So after all of that, after all of the heaviness, after all of the, the heartache and the, the desperation that they are, they're feeling and they're going through, Ezekiel delivers to them a message of hope. And it's not just for Israel, and it's not just for the surrounding nations, but it is for all of creation. And he says, tell the people that there is hope. That after this terrible destruction, God will will raise up a king for them. It will be the king they need. The king they need. They don't know it yet, but it won't necessarily be the king that they want. It will be like a second coming of David. So when Jesus comes, because he is this king that Ezekiel is prophesying, Ezekiel is not around for when Jesus comes. He is actually prophesying this 700 years before Jesus is ever born. He is telling them that there will come a king. It will be the, the king that you need. He will be like a second coming of David. He will be a perfect king. So when we think about how when Jesus came and he was, and people were saying he's the son of God, he's the king, he's, he's the king of kings, They were expecting someone who looked like David, who sounded like David, who made the proclamations that David made. That's what they were looking for. And Ezekiel says that this king is going to come, and he's going to bring about transformation. He's going to take your heart of stone, your rebellious heart, and he's going to replace that with a soft heart. And his spirit is going to be among your people. It is going to be a holy spirit. This king, like I said, is Jesus. And the spirit that he says he's going to send among his people is the Holy Spirit, the one that you and I both know and that we have access to right now. Then it's given to Ezekiel this vision of the valley of dry bones. Have we heard of this? Have we heard of this vision? Yes. It's a beautiful, it is a beautiful kind of scary vision where Ezekiel is, is seeing what looks like the destruction that they are facing right now in this valley of dry bones. And I think that sometimes people read this and they're like, wow, there's so much hope in there, because there is. But if you don't know the context of what the people have been through, what the Israelite people have been through, the devastation that they have suffered, this will pale in comparison to knowing everything that they have gone through to get to this point. So read everything with context. Like Matt said last week, perspective is everything. This is a little bit long, but bear with me. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put, I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied and I commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared on them, and the skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And then he said, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied and he comm- as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. 
Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. And then you will know that the Lord has spoken. And I, ha and I have done it, declares the Lord. So all of that, all of what we have heard and seen, we can take from that that rebellion equals death. It equals physical death, moral death, and spiritual death. We might be thinking, why are we talking about this? This is like such a dated, dated story. How does this apply? But if you look at the world today, what do you see? You see rebellion. You see confusion. And what does that mean? It means death. Israel is devastated to the point that all that is left is a valley of dry bones. There is nothing but death and ruin as far as the eye can see. God says to Ezekiel, he asks him, can these dry bones live again? And Ezekiel appeals to God's wisdom and God's power. Is there hope for the valley of death? There is if the Christian people are willing to stand up and speak to a lost and dying world. God can breathe new life again in our city, on your marriage, in our families, on this nation, at the world at large. It was so and it will be so again. And then, as we're, as we're going through this timeline, it looks like the fall of Jeru it looks like exile, the fall of Jerusalem, this devastation that takes place, the resurrection of God's people, and then another attack. And this is attack that Ezekiel calls Gog. And when he describes him in the Bible, he describes him as kind of like this evil, wicked king who has this huge army. And this is meant to symbolize the nations around them and rebellion. He is a metaphorical stand-in for any rebellious human act, and his name is Gog. And he's powerful, and he's scary, and, I, and he, is, he, comes in cyclical, he comes in cyclical motion. We've seen him before, and we will see him again, and I believe we are seeing him right now. So this Gog, again, he's described as this wicked, evil king. He stands as a symbol of rebellion. All the things that come together that, about humans who want to control, humans who want to be God, humans who want to say, I know what's right, I choose what is good, I tr choose what is true, and wanting to be God of their own lives equals Gog. You follow me? Okay, so after the Valley of Dry Bones, God's people are resurrected. Then Ezekiel has this vision about Gog. So Gog says in Ezekiel 38, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and living without gates and bars. I will plunder and loot and turn my hand against the resettled ruins and the people gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. And it talks about this great attack that is going to come on people who are not expecting it, who are not looking for it, who are not watching for it. It talks about people who are living in peace, in unity, who have all of the riches that they could possibly need, and God comes with his army, and he decimates again. And God will be used to show God's ultimate love, power, and devotion for his creation. Out of rebellion comes destruction, and out of destruction comes new life. But this is not the end. Gog doesn't win. So there is always hope. That is, that is what is so important about these stories, is that there is always hope. There is always a renewal. Gog, being depicted as this evil king with his army, is said that he will be destroyed through plague and bloodshed, torrents of rain, hailstone, burning sulfur, earthquakes, fire, and death by the swords by the sword, that God's justice will be complete. And 
what does that say about old times? Like I said, it, about our time currently. Like I said, I feel like we have seen this cyclical Gog come again and again and again. He's come in the embodiment of the Roman Empire. He has come looking like Nazis. He has come looking like communism. He has come in the form of slavery. Anytime culture rises up and says something that is in rebellion to God's word, this is Gog. And he will build momentum and he will, he will convince those who are not watching, those, un, those settled people who don't have bars and don't have gates and aren't watching and examining what is going on in the world, he will build an army of these unsuspecting people. And like I said, I believe that we are seeing it again right now. I believe that our culture is at a fever pitch. People are desperate for the truth, desperate for the truth. So we have false prophets who are giving a truth that isn't an actual truth, that isn't the truth of Jesus. Every time we turn on the news, we see the wickedness of Gog. Gog is amalgamation of all of the hum, evil human dissension. Gog as complete rebellion against God's restoration for his creation. God wants to restore, and Gog wants to destroy. Some headlines that I have read in the past two weeks. Gog is mail-order abortion. You can abort your baby, your unborn baby, in the, in the comfort of your home. That is Gog. Gog is an, an Australian lockdown. Is a, a country in lockdown, and its people cannot attend church. That is Gog. In, in Afghanistan, you, you will die. In Australia, you could be imprisoned. In Afghanistan, they will kill you. Gog is the normalizing of pedophilia and the separation that, pe that people and culture are trying to put between parents and their children. This is happening right now. We are seeing it in our culture, and it starts small. It starts as a whisper, and then people hear it, and they feed off from it, and it keeps growing, and it keeps growing. Gog is a man, a former special, Army Special Forces who lived as a man for 30 years, transitioned into a woman and is supported by our culture by getting into an MMA ring and cracking open a woman's skull. This is Gog. That if they look like a woman, then they can beat on other women, regardless of their genetic differences, bone and mu muscular differences. This is Gog. Gog is a culture that screams about social justice and racism, but will tell your white children that they are inherently racist even when they don't know what that means. Or the problems that we have created. No child should be told that. They should be told that they should be raised in truth and to love all people, all God's people, not that they are inherently evil, when they don't even know what that means. Gog is the infiltration and normalization of human trafficking. Gog is a woke world saying that you can deny your biological sex, cut and alter your body. You can kill the unborn child in your womb. You can drink yourself into liver failure, but if you, don't have a vac if you are not vaccinated and you get sick, we will not treat you. That is Gog. Gog is hypocrisy. Gog is communism. Gog is slavery. And Gog is pride. Gog is rebellion. But ultimately, Gog will be destroyed. Let's, let's give Jesus a praise for that, okay? Gog will be destroyed. But like I said at the beginning, our Bibles, we have to know what is Gog and who is God. And the only place that we're going to find that is in, is in the Bible, is in the Word of God, is in a, a relationship, not an experience, we're not about experiences here. We're about authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. We're about authentic relationship with each other. You're going to find that protection and that safety and that covering in community. So you need to be here. In Matthew 10, 16, it says, Behold, I am sending you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We must be feeding ourselves with the hope and the wisdom of God. We need to be edifying ourselves daily for the dark days that will come. And at Crew this week, 
we, we get together, the girls and the guys, and we talk about the week's previous message. We have questions. We, we talk about how we can make it applicable to our lives. If there's any area where we, we need more understanding, we need more context, we talk about those things. And as we were kind of wading through the questions, I, I asked, how, how's everybody feeling right now? Living in the season and the age that we're living in. How, how are you guys feeling? You feel good? You feel full of joy and full of hope? And how do you feel? Almost every single person said, afraid. I feel afraid. One mother shared that she is afraid for her children. She's afraid for what they will be taught. She is afraid of how to protect them in wisdom and grow them in truth. And another person shared that they were afraid of the state of the world. That a nation founded in freedom feels less and less free every single day. And this is real. And, it's, and we feel it. We understand. But after talking about those fears, we talked about the hope that we have in Jesus. The hope and the power that comes from the Holy Spirit the covering, the light inside of us, and the knowing that no matter what this world does, he is with us. He is for us. And some of us even went on to say that, devil, do your worst. Because we're ready. And not everybody's to that point. But if we have to march, we will march. We will know our rights we will speak to our representatives and those in powers. We will plead with them, just like Ezekiel did, to take on the wisdom of God, to hear us, to hear our cry. We will fight the good fight, and we will show the world that God's people are not weak because they serve the one true God. Can we put our hands together for, yes, come on. Come on. I know it's serious, I know it's heavy, but this is such a message of hope, I don't want that to be missed. There is more hope in here than anything else. As God's people, we know that we will stand firm in the truth, and just like Ezekiel, we know that we, it will not be easy. It will be tough. And our, all of us already know that have been Christians for any amount of time that there is suffering that comes with taking on the mantle of a Christian. And though we are, we are facing a time of great uncertainty, we are recalled to the proclamation that we said earlier of the king that has come and we will see come again. At the very end, Ezekiel has a vision of a new temple. This is at the very, very end of a new temple replacing the old temple that has been destroyed in the holy city. The new temple will be beautiful. He sees God's holy presence returning to this temple, and he sees a river flowing out of this temple and on into the land. And it says in Ezekiel 47, there will be swarms of living things wherever this water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this water flows. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along the sides of this river. The, the leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall off, and there will always be fruit on its branches. There will be a new crop every month, for it will be watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be good, and its leaves will be filled with healing. I believe that this temple is you and me. It's us. We are the new temple. And I believe that the river flowing out of this temple is the Holy Spirit. And I believe that if you are a Christian and you love Jesus, your life will always be filled with fruit, and there will be healing in your leaves. And that is such a message of hope for all of us right now. This river will flow with the hope that we feel and will flow with revival and healing in the mighty name of Jesus. And I need to say this, that God is the author of freedom. God is the author of freedom. He is the author of truth. And the way that some people talk about it, freedom is something a political leader created. Freedom is a nation. Freedom is a social justice movement. Freedom is a vaccine. God is freedom, and he is the author of truth. He is our freedom. He is our redemption. He is our hope, and he 
will be the light in the dark age that we are living in right now. We are called to live in a world that is lying to us, where humanity has adopted and been seduced by the lies of Gog. But listen, when God is not sacred, nothing is sacred. When we don't see how sacred and holy God is, nothing will be sacred and holy. Not human life, not your sexuality, not your marriage, not your religion, not your children, and not your church. We are called to examine this world with the cunning of a snake. Some of us have trusted the news more than we have trusted the word of God. Some of us have looked to a political figure to bring us the freedom and peace that we know and we want to see in our life. And some of us are looking for the keys to our identities on Instagram and Twitter when we have in our hand all we need to know written and God breathed about who we are in Christ and why we are put here. We are called to live in a world and remain as innocent as a dove. And I don't know about you, but those headlines, those create feelings in me that are not innocent. Those create feelings in me of anger that I have to repent for. As a dove, it is to be in a sinful world, but not given over to sin. We have to pray for our enemies and those who stand against the kingdom of God. Pray for a movement of God. Pray for your political leaders. Pray for those in your life who do not believe in Jesus or who, or who even come against you in harm. Pray, 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 because they are children of God and he loves them desperately. People, we have, to put more, we have to put more faith in our spiritual weapons than any ammunition or amount of guns that we could possibly buy. We have to believe, we have to believe that we are God's people and we are that temple. That the river is the Holy Spirit flowing from us to a decimated land. That our lives will be filled with fruit and healing will be in our leaves. And I understand that the book of Ezekiel is a very, very heavy book. But do not miss the message of hope that is for them and is now for us and is forever. Hope for you and for me and for all of creation. I pray that you take that with you today out into the world and out into the rest of your life, that message of hope. Let's turn our face to the living king one more time as we stand and we get into worship. This morning, I would like to just say a prayer over hard hearts. We want to swap out hard hearts for hearts that are soft and tender and being touched by God daily. Does that sound good? All right. Let's pray. God, thank you for your holy word. Thank you even when it's uncomfortable, even when we wrestle, even when there's confusion about what the world is saying and what they're saying about you and what they're saying about your word and what they're saying about truth and things being old and decrepit and dated, it's not true. You are the author of creation, God. Jesus, I just pray for this nation and for our world right now and for anyone who is in need of a soft heart that God, you would take our heart of stone that the scales would fall from our eyes. Jesus, that we would see you in truth, that we would see ourselves and each other in truth, and God, that we would cover, carry that into a lost and dying world. God, we praise you, and we give you all of the glory. In your mighty name, God's people said, amen.